the sausage became a famous thing during the war. There were sausages and there were sausages. Some you could eat and some you couldn't. Well, of course, a great deal of food has to be imported and still is um, and couldn't be in the war. Um, so we all had ration books. I should think we probably did miss chocolates and sweets a bit because I don't think there were very many of those around. You had your ration book. And this is how cues began, because he took your ration book and he could see how much meat you were allowed, so much per person, and he had to tear one of these little tickets out to keep it to say that he'd served you with that amount of meat. And therefore, it took time. That is how the cues began. And if you saw a cue, you would say, what are you queuing for? I'm not sure. You'd ask somebody else. The fishmongers had a couple of boxes. All right, we get on the end of the queue, we might be able to buy some fish. A lot of uh, meat had bone in it, such as a shoulder of lamb. Well, you can't eat bone. Therefore, the butcher had to work out Bone was off ration, sausages were off ration, but they could only have a certain amount of meat, the odds and ends of meat and pork rinds. The sausage became a famous thing during the war. There were sausages and there were sausages. Some you could eat and some you couldn't. And the skins were never right, they used to explode. You know, nobody really wanted sausages, but you had to have them. I've been a vegetarian for over 85 years. So when the war came, um, I didn't at the moment think this is going to be difficult, but the government seemed to have some sort of um, soft spot for vegetarians because they allowed you to uh, revoke your meat ration and have an enhanced ration of cheese. My dad always had bread and cheese for supper and a glass of beer. That was his supper. And he got a bit of bread, put a bit of butter on it, cut the cheese. And the next night he took a bit of cheese and my mum said to him, and that's your ration, you can't have any more cheese. He got another bit of bread, she said, and don't keep spreading the butter. You can't have butter on every slice of bread. Butter went on bread if you ate it as a bit of bread. If you had a sandwich, you put margarine in. From time to time I'd go and stay with a friend for one or two nights, always. Um, Mum would prepare it and I'd take my rations with me, which I'd hand over to the housewife and she'd do her best. I mean, really, the tiny little bit of sugar and the minute amount of, of butter, um, I don't think it would have made any difference anyway. You learnt to eat other things. We had queer things from the butchers, stuff called chitlin, which didn't taste at all bad. I think that was the small intestine. And then we had brawn that was made. Tongue was very nice. Heart was quite nice. They were both very meaty. There was one dish I really loved, which was called L Walton Pie. Lord Walton was the Minister of Food, and uh, it must have been a government uh, recipe that they had for vegetable pie. And it was all kind of chopped up vegetables in a white sauce with a pastry lid. And I loved Walton Pie. Nobody ever eats it now. Didn't seem to get jam very much. We made our own at school. We didn't, but the teachers did. And it was mainly marrow jam because <laughs> Miss Toombs could grow marrows in the kitchen garden, you see, and some of the sugar was used to make the, the jam. So if it was jam, it was nearly always marrow jam. Not very nice. I don't, as a child, remember feeling hungry in the war. It's amazing. And of course, all of the parks were dug up. People had allotments. 
people dug their gardens. I mean, you've seen the posters, dig for victory. In the long school holidays, mum used to send me away to a farm to stay. And of course, they had their own milk, so they made their own cream. Different standard of food altogether there. My grandfather would go and shoot a rabbit or pigeon or something. Uh, they also, my mother kept hens. Um, they grew vegetables in the garden. Our meat rations were very, very small. Luckily, we had lots of fish. Um, really, every few streets there seemed to be a Mac fisheries. Great big marble slabs sloping down from the back of the shop to the front, running with water, covered with fish. And you went, you chose your fish, and immediately put others on the slab because we were uh, near Avonmouth docks and near the sea, and the fishermen were able to get the, the fish into Bristol quite easily. So we had lots of fish to eat. And then the people would come in from the countryside and want to bargain, and they would have caught, say, two rabbits. Like, remember, they used to come into the shop with their two rabbits, you see, and try and bargain for some uh, cigarettes or sweets. And I can remember my poor mother had to skin the rabbits before we could even start cooking them. <laughs> um, clothing. I don't know when it came in. There was rationing. You had... Um, Books, you know, and you so many coupons, and you'd save them up if you wanted a winter coat, for instance. But I, I suppose I learned from then. I, I'd get my favourite clothes, like my winter coat. I can remember I had a brown um, wool gabardine raincoat in those days, and it wore and wore so that the the piece down here, the edging, became frayed. And in the end, my friends had to talk me out of continuing to wear it. <laughs> we didn't get. Well, only very few uh, clothes rations. And, of course, when I left the Rens and went to work at the British Embassy, the one thing I really needed was clothes. And my aunt luckily had some black velvet curtains and she got a dressmaker to make these into a, an evening dress for me. But there were dances and this black velvet dress was so narrow because there wasn't a lot of curtain material it was really quite difficult to dance at all. I had to sort of do a very limited, rather peculiar kind of dancing. Um, there was still a newspaper, magazines. Um, paper, of course, got more and more scarce. Um, and by the end, <laughs> you'd get a newspaper, just two sheets, as it were, folded. So you'd have one, two, three, four, five, six, eight pages, but that was the limit. But in many ways, I found those newspapers much better than the modern ones because what was printed was really worth printing. Petrol was rationed. Um, my mother got an allowance to take her elderly father to church and um, also for her ARP work. But um, petrol was pretty tightly rationed and, um, well, even hot water because we were using fuel and electricity. So I have heard that the royal family had a line round their bath at Windsor Castle, and a lot of people did this and had lines round their baths. So you only had a bath in a few inches of water, um, and this helped to save fuel. Sort of one size in the services, the rationing didn't apply. Uh, we got our supplies direct, I think, from naval catering. And um, cocoa was in good supply, the wrens, because working night shifts, there was nothing like a hot mug of cocoa to cheer you up at half past three in the morning. My uncle, who lived in the house, he... Um was a builder by, by trade. And he got a lot of work for a firm on American air bases. And I remember the Americans were very free and easy with their food supplies, and he would manage to get hold of lots of tins of food that would otherwise not be available to a rationed um, community. And the word got round that the American police on the base were very concerned about the disappearance of all this food stuff and they were coming around looking for it. And I remember my uncle digging a big hole in the garden and burying it all. Rationing. 
rationing was gradually cut down or, or reduced, but it certainly went on after the war. And I do remember arriving in America where nothing was rationed and feeling like bursting into tears at the sight of a supermarket laden with all the things that uh, you hadn't seen in that profusion for all your life, really. <laughs> <laughs>